I'll get started. So my name is uh, Miro, and uh, this is joint work with Alex Agakua, Carl Kosher, and uh, Yoshi Kono from the University of Washington Computer Science and Engineering Department. And uh, the, <clears throat> the motivation for our work was to try and understand the emerging technology, which is the modern automobile. Uh, and as you probably know, it's increasingly becoming computerized and connected. This is just a uh, diagram of some of the embedded computing units that are under the hood if you were to look at the communication network that's occurring in a modern vehicle. Um, and sort of a more formal diagram of that is represented here where you see the various controllers that are interacting over what's known as the, the CAN bus or the controller area network. Um, and as we've seen from many previous studies, security is a really major threat in this space. Uh, and various folks have demonstrated the kinds of things that you can do in this space if you were to actually gain control of that communication area network. Uh, you know, you're able to, to jump on and, and f essentially exploit a buffer overflow from the radio to inject packets and pretend that you're the brake system and there's no verification happening and so you can start to create all kinds of havoc uh, to someone who's you know, trying to normally operate their vehicle. So there's lots of effort now uh, being uh, done by manufacturers and OEMs in, in investing and in securing these resources. And um, I think that this is an area that, that's seeing a lot of active research, both from industry and from, from academia. On the other hand, relatively little is known about the privacy risks in this space. And the, the risks, on the other hand, are, are steadily increasing as the, the data sharing marketplace of the vehicle is growing and growing. We see uh, insurance companies who are trying to help you save by uh, figuring out whether or not you're a good driver. We see lots of these uh, solutions which you can purchase for, from Amazon and plug into your car and then tether to your phone and add all kinds of smarts to, to your automobile. There's also lots of interest from the government in trying to make cars safer through vehicle-to-vehicle uh, -vehicle communication and vehicle-to-infrastructure communication. Um, so our goal was to uh, try to understand exactly uh, privacy from the perspective of driver identification. So we wanted to understand whether we can uniquely identify uh, which among a set of end people is driving by using snippets of the uh, most basic vehicle sensor messages that, that are happening uh, in, in the car network. And we chose driver identification for, for numerous reasons. Uh, one, we felt that it was intellectually challenging. The chance of correctly guessing the, the driver given a set of N drivers is one over N as opposed to some things like categorical distinctions like, you know, is this driver drunk or drowsy? And also those kinds of distinctions are really difficult to get with IRB approval. We really wanted to see if we could avoid uh, having to ask our university to see if we can give people alcohol before getting behind the wheel. So um, we also find that this is an important problem by communicating with various car manufacturers and startups who are really interested in understanding the space of driver identification. There's lots of positive and negative uses that are, can occur with this data. On the positive side, you can imagine something like um, being able to do theft prevention, and on the negative side, you know, you could potentially implicate people in whenever they're breaking the law. Um, so <clears throat> from, a, from a privacy uh, analytics perspective, this was something that was very interesting to us and we wanted to understand if we could set some kind of a, a lower bound uh, on, on our expectations of privacy by focusing on the most simple components, the, the, the basic vehicle sensors. And uh, we have a limitation of, of an N of 15 folks, which was uh, you know, partly imposed by the fact that this had to be a three hour study with each individual, but we still think that this is a significant number for our first study. So uh, getting into a little bit of the details, this is sort of our experimental setup. Uh, the vehicle that we used was a 2009 uh, Chevy Impala, and we connected to the uh, onboard diagnostics port uh, of the vehicle, which is where you get your car emissions checked, and also where you would plug into if you were you know, trying to monitor the, uh, the health of your, of your vehicle with some of these new uh, sensors that are commercially available. And we tethered that to a laptop and monitored from the list of 15 sensors that you see on the right-hand side of the screen there. Just for uh, information purposes, these, <clears throat> these sensors have various reporting rates, as you can see from the three sensors that I've sort of tried to break down here at the bottom. So the, the brake pedal position is reported at a much uh, more rapid rate than the currently available torque to the car. 
uh, and they also have different ranges over which they operate. So our experimental design was, again, as I mentioned, 15 drivers, uh, 8 male, 7 female, <clears throat> using uh, the Chevy Impala. And we uh, asked these folks to perform, uh, you know, driving in a parking lot environment, which was isolated from all other drivers, as well as a 50-mile open road uh, stretch. And uh, we tried to have the conditions be maximally ad identical, so we had uh, the same start time for the experiments, and we also made them listen to the same sort of pop rock uh, st radio station. So uh, the, the parking lot setup was uh, it's part of our university campus was gracious to allow us to use a, a closed off section of the, of the parking lot to perform these various maneuvers. So we had the, the drivers familiar, familiarize themselves with the car and perform three laps, the first of which was practice and the second two laps which we used for analytics. And I'll show you a quick video here of, um, of sort of what it looks like from, from our dash cam where the driver is performing um, a three-point turn, and then um, they'll go around and perform a reverse weave through these five cones, <clears throat> and then uh, they'll perform other things like a, a parallel park. And this is just a snippet from one of the three lap laps that they were asked to perform. And, and this is actually 2x speed, so this is uh, just for illustrative purposes. But you can get a, a somewhat of a sense of, of what the parking lot section looked like. All right, we're coming up to the parallel park. All right, and we'll stop the video there. Okay, so um, Okay, so for the open road uh, data section, uh, open uh, road part of the of the driving, the selection criteria for us was that we wanted to have the start and end on our campus, and we wanted it to be long enough so that uh, folks would get familiar with um, with the vehicle and start to exhibit their natural driving tendencies. And so this incorporated driving across residential, city, highway, and back roads. Um, and this is just uh, from one driver's uh, trip. This is the, the velocity plotted over time. And <clears throat> you can notice that, for example, the green sections are all highway driving, and they tend to have high velocity, whereas some of the uh, downtown driving, which is highlighted here in, in pink, ends up having a lot of stop and go, and so you end up getting these velocity peaks and valleys. Um, <clears throat> here is uh, a sort of a little bit of a deeper dive within some of those sections. So again, the downtown is the first one here shown in, in pink. And if you just look at some of the sensor values that are occurring during that time, uh, the red is the is the brake, the the blue is the vehicle speed, um, and you can see sort of the alternating pattern of of brake of brakes and, and gas. Um, interestingly, some folks tend to sort of, you know, push down on the brake pedal more so while they're parked rather than others. And then um, this here, the the bottom plot is a sort of technical back road driving where there's lots of loops and turns. And let me just very briefly show you a little bit of that. Again, this is at uh, 4x speed, so this is going quite fast. But, uh, but you can see, you know, this is kind of like uh, an interesting section of, of Mercer Island around Seattle where uh, folks had a chance to sort of show off some of their, their fancy turns and stuff. So we tried to incorporate a mix of, of various driving conditions um, just to enable some of these unique uh, driver fingerprints to come out. But as our results ended up showing, you don't actually need to do anything fancy to have people's diverse driving strategies uh, come out. So um, <clears throat> just a, a word on how we did this, some of this data analysis. For each of the, the various sensory streams, we did some smoothing, uh, resampling to get everything down to the same uh, data rate, so 60 hertz. And then we did uh, tiled sliding windows so that 25% uh, of the windows were overlapped to allow for <coughs> really large variations to not occur at window edges. And uh, for each of these windows, we computed a bunch of statistics, uh, such as you know, min, max, average, uh, various quartiles, and uh, some frequency components as well, such as the energies and the, and the bins. And then we scaled all of, all of these features uh, from the from the training data, so we did 
you know, tenfold cross validation, and, and during each uh, training fold, we would figure out what the uh, scaling uh, parameters were. So the the average and the standard deviation, and then we would apply the same scaling to it whenever we did our test queries. Um, one interesting thing about the way we did the classification here was that uh, unlike sort of tr maybe traditional methods where you do one versus all comparisons, we did uh, a matrix of pairwise sort of specialized classifiers. So what I'm trying to show with the slide here is that you would take all of the sliding window feature vectors computed for one subject, which were part of the training batch, and you would combine those with all of the sliding windows features from a second subject, and that would uh, allow you to train one specialized classifier that's able to distinguish just between those two subjects. And that would essentially be one cell of this matrix. So in order to, the, or at least the approach that we took here, is that we'd need to populate the upper section of this matrix since uh, it doesn't really matter whether or not you train a classifier between subject one or two, or between subject two and one, they're essentially the same. So the, the upper triangular section of this matrix is all you need. And for our purposes, that meant that for n subjects, we needed to train uh, n squared over two classifiers. And, uh, and actually, in order to do you know, retrieval or, or search over this matrix given a, a set of queries, you only need n log n lookups using this algorithm that we used uh, Q-weighted. So uh, long story short, the, the results of what we found, I, I think, were pretty compelling. And that is to say that um, you don't need very much data in order to be able to, to do uh, positive identification over the set of subjects we looked at. So we reached 91.33% uh, accuracy when all of our sensors were available just on the parking lot data. So those two loops, which were about eight minutes in total. Uh, you could also use just a single sensor, and, and this was pretty interesting. It turns out that uh, probably the most differentiable thing in, in people's driving styles is how they decelerate or how they use the brake pedal. And so um, if, you if you just take about the first 15 minutes of, uh, of the drive, which kind of looked like this, where uh, folks were going from our university campus down to the Space Needle in Seattle, if you take these 15 minutes uh, of driving, you know, where people are doing mergers onto the highway, a few lane shifts, and then a bunch of turns, then uh, with just the brake pedal during this 15 minutes, uh, you are able to identify drivers at a really high rate. I think we reached like 88% approximately. And then if you took just the brake pedal over the course of the entire trip, uh, you were able to get 100% accuracy uh, across our drivers. Um, <clears throat> so I think, uh, you know, and of course, if you take all sensors across the drive, you get 100% uh, very easily. One last thing I'll mention is uh, this extension that we did uh, to try and understand how stable the fingerprint of the driver was uh, across different days. So uh, for that particular study, we had one driver repeat uh, five days of, of this 22 mile trip from the university. Um, and uh, you know, whenever we use those, those new trips as part of a query against our old data set where the driver had performed the same trip that everyone else did, we ended up getting 91% accuracy. And whenever we excluded the driver's uh, data for, from the data set um, and then tried to query with their new instances of those five trips, we ended up getting uh, lots of confusion. The, the, you know, the network couldn't figure out who to attribute this data to. So it was, it was guessing quite poorly, the, which is to say that you know, if, if we don't have a record of someone and you try to identify them, then that also isn't going to work well, which again sends to say that the fingerprinting is, it seems to be quite stable. Uh, uh, this is um, some of the top sensors that were useful here. Uh, the brake pedal, as I mentioned, the steering wheel, and then the, the lateral acceleration. Uh, th this is all available in the paper in case you're interested. Uh, and also just a hierarchical clustering of, of some of the correlations between the sensor data. Um, <clears throat> I'll briefly just mention that I think, you know, we, we use the N of 15 and uh, it would be very interesting for future work to try and understand how this would work for, for larger sets of, of candidate uh, pools of drivers. One kind of encouraging, uh, you know, result in this, in this direction is that uh, even if you take the most similar drivers and you sort of project their data uh, in, into two dimensions, you end up seeing that there are some areas where they end up diverging, which is to say that, you know, with additional effort here, you could probably come up with some features that are really useful for fingerprinting. Uh, and again, this is feature work most likely. So as far as defenses, um, <clears throat> we're just proposing some things here. And uh, the thing that we think it could be promising is feature transformations um, of the data sort of in real time that would still enable some kind of 
inferences to occur. Or you could imagine these, these dongles that the insurance company plugs into your car. You could sort of get your own sort of defensive dongle that their dongle would plug into and run some kind of filtering techniques on it. Uh, or you could alternatively inject packets uh, by the car, maybe if you get manufacturer buy in here, so that you would sort of obfuscate or at least introduce some noise that would make these kinds of privacy attacks a little harder. Um, so that's it, uh, and this is some of the summary and takeaway that I'll leave up during the QA.